This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So I'm delighted to welcome today to the History of Sexuality Seminar our two speakers, Adrian Bingham and Lucy Delap, who um, probably need no introduction, but um, very briefly, um, Adrian Bingham is reader in modern history at Sheffield University, and he's written um, two major books on the history of the popular press in Britain. The most recent family newspapers, Private Life in the British Popular Press, 1918 to 1978, and before that, Gender Modernity in the Popular Press and Into All Britain. Um, Lucy, Lucy de Lapp is University Lecturer in Modern British History at Murray Edwards College, University of Cambridge. Well, I think you've been moving between London and Cambridge, <laughs> but now firmly back in Cambridge. Um, many people will know Lucy's recent book, Knowing Their Place, Domestic Service in 20th Century Britain. And I certainly enjoyed the chapter on humour and try to get my students to <laughs> analyse analyze, um, analyze it. And uh, Lucy's also recently edited a book, I think, co-edited a book of Men, Masculinities and Reli Religious Change of Britain since 1890. Um, Adrian and Lucy, together with um, Louise Jackson, have been involved in this recent project, which they're going to talk about, on um, the med media representation of child sexual abuse. So um, we're delighted to get two of the three of them here to talk about that. Um, a couple of points before we start, we normally go around and introduce ourselves briefly, and if there's any upcoming um, relevant conferences, papers and so on that you want to alert everybody else to, then please feel free to do that. Um, the, the actual um, seminar papers will be podcast, or at least they will be recorded. Um, apparently we don't normally record the or at least we don't normally um, put up online the um, question and answers. And I think because this is a, a particularly um, sensitive topic, um, we will certainly not necessarily do that in this case, or at least we'll be very careful about what we put up online. But the papers themselves will be podcast. Um, and if anyone wants to you know, ask or make any comment about that, then please do so. You can talk to me or Justin or Kiara the conveners about that and afterwards we hope to go for at least a drink and possibly something to eat um, with um, at least one of the speakers so please join us for that i look to my colleagues for the venue as ever <laughs> um, okay so if we go around to introduce ourselves first can we start over here hi my name is alexis Sardino, and i'm currently attending richmond university and I had a current event having to do with journalism because my major is journalism and intercultural communications. So that's why I'm here and I was very interested in the topic. Um, my name is Eric Frasco. I'm also studying here at the university, um, working on the same project. Hi, I'm JC, medical researcher at Queen Mary University of London. I'm involved with clinical trials. Hello there, hi, my name is John, I'm, I'm from the University of Oxford, I'm, I'm a clinical student and I'm interested in uh, histories of uh, children who face early adversity. Pleasure Hall, formerly archivist at the Wellcome Library, now retired Wellcome Library Research Fellow and um, I've had a long-standing interest in history of sexuality. Uh, Camilla Pellram, I'm associate professor at the University of Aarhus, Denmark, and I have a research group there in sexuality studies, and I just um, submitted a big grant application on uh, children and sexuality, so I'm very interested in hearing what you're saying. I'm Justin Benby, I'm a research fellow at Kirkbeck, and I research uh, histories of capitalism and homosexuality, and I'm a convene, one of the conveners um, of, of the seminar. I'm Karen Mikalasse from the University of Lincoln. I work on the modern history of sexuality in Europe, a bit on Britain, and uh, I'm also one of the conveners of the seminars. 
I'm Janet Weston. I'm a PhD student at um, Beckbeck in London, um, and I've just uh, submitted my thesis on medical approaches to sexual offenders over the middle of the 20th century. Congratulations. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm still slightly <laughs> shocked by it all. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Let's, um, we're going to start with Adrian and then follow that on with Lucy's paper. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm going to start uh, off with a few words about the project. Um, so, this is an ESRC urgency grant funded where unusually research councils get back to you uh, very quickly. Uh, this was something that we designed in the summer uh, of last year uh, when the government announced it was going to uh, establish a Public inquiry into historical child sex abuse. So we thought that we would try and align um, our work with the timetable as then was for that uh, inquiry. Um, we bid for uh, eight or nine months funding. So this was very much uh, a sort of scoping project rather than a full-blown uh, project, um, looking to identify key moments over the last hundred years when abuse reached public awareness through the media criminal justice or policy responses. And the three of us, so Louise Jackson at Edinburgh, who was the PI, uh, Lucy and myself, took on one of three arms of, of the project, essentially. Um, Louise uh, investigating court and legal records, Lucy looking at social worker and practitioner responses, and my uh, part of the project was to look at uh, press coverage. Obviously, we didn't realise then we had grand plans uh, of feeding in to a uh, public inquiry, which was originally supposed to report in May or June of this year, and that was how we had combined our project. Obviously, we didn't know then that the public inquiry would fall apart twice, uh, be reconstituted, and now uh, not report until what well, I was looking like 2020 or something like that. Um, so we're hoping um, to put in uh, a bid for further funding to do uh, further research and maybe we'll actually arrive uh, this time uh, to, to the sort of eventual um, report. So in my half of the paper I want to talk about my arm um, of the, the project which is looking at changing patterns of press coverage between 1918 and 1970s. Um, and as my title suggests, I'm as interested in what was not said as much as what was. Um, and what I want to try and sketch out relatively briefly today is why child sexual abuse moved to the top of the public agenda at certain moments, such as in the 1880s, for example, with W.T. Stead's infamous uh, investigation of child prostitution. Um, or the increasingly intense bursts of publicity and activity since the late 1970s, but not at other times. So in the sort of middle decades of uh, the 20th century, which I'm going to focus on today, there was relative um, inattention and lack of publicity to this issue. So I want to try and um, think about and identify some of the factors which cause and explain these shifts in discussion and debate. I'm going to start with a few words uh, about the term child sexual abuse, which is of course a contemporary and contested concept which is difficult to apply in areas where legal, scientific and popular understandings of sexuality and sexual offences could be very different. In my work on the press, I'm less interested in developing or applying specific definitions than in studying an unfolding and unfolding an uneven process of definition in which sexual acts uh, that were often viewed in different ways came to be grouped together as a discrete category of child sexual abuse. This process of definition was shaped by a number of different political, cultural and institutional dynamics, as well as by inequalities of power as campaigners and reformers contested the views of the political, legal and media establishment. It's clear that the cautious and euphemistic sexual culture of the first half of the 20th century and the ways in which the sexual exploitation of children often lacked coherent legal definition and were subsumed into wider categories of indecency and immorality was an obstacle to publicity and activism around child sexual abuse. But the absence of an accepted and convenient legal or medical term is not sufficient to explain relative inattention in these decades. <coughs> 
the notion of an age of consent raised from 13 to 16 in 1885 had very long historical roots and by the Victorian period the belief that children required protection from adult violence and sexual attention was well established. Organisations such as the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, founded in 1884, as well as many women's groups, sought to raise public awareness about the threats faced by young people. As Louise Jackson has observed, although Victorians had no umbrella term that was uniformly applied, they certainly would have recognised the term child sexual abuse. And even if only a small proportion of what we would now call child sexual abuse offences reached the legal system, there were still plenty of cases to report. As Louise's research for this project has shown, uh, in the 1920s, over 500 people a year went before the courts for sexual offences against children, rising tenfold to, uh, to 5,000 sorry, by the 1960s. So the argument I want to sketch out today is that child sexual abuse stays high on the public agenda when there is a combination of three key factors. First, active, well-resourced and publicity-aware groups campaigning on issues of women's rights, morality or sexual reform. Second, state or parliamentary receptiveness to reforming the laws governing sex and or politicians with the energy to pursue the issue. And third, a press or media willing to become active participants in the debate on law and order and seeking to crusade on issues of sex, gender and morality. When this combination of factors is not found, and I'm going to argue that it was not in the decades I'm looking at today, attention has remained low level and intermittent. So in the first part of the paper I want to uh, look at the reporting of child sexual abuse in the 1920s and 30s. It notes the continued presence of child sexual abuse in the pages of the press, but also the press's lack of interest in highlighting it as an issue of wider public concern. The reporting was largely court-focused and very passive in nature, shaped by a fatalistic acceptance that such cases were a regrettable but inevitable outcome of the weakness and moral corruption of certain individuals. Editors and reporters did not challenge the definitions and frames developed by legal practitioners and the judiciary, and while occasional criticisms of the law and its enforcement were voiced, these were given little prominence and rarely followed up. I'll then trace some minor shifts in the 1950s and 60s as narratives of sexual danger became more prominent in the press, before concluding with a few observations about the sudden and dramatic shifts in reporting in the late 1970s and 80s, when the press suddenly took up the issues of paedophilia and sexual abuse as a matter of urgent public concern, and then sort of reflect on what that reveals about this earlier period. Okay, so I'm going to start looking at the, the 1920s and 30s. Um, the press was certainly not silent about sexual abuse of children after 1918. On the contrary, it featured fairly regularly, if euphemistically, in court reporting. There was coverage of parliamentary discussions of the laws governing sex, particularly those related to the age of consent and the acceptable legal, legal defences in cases involving minors. And there were some broader discussions of social conditions, such as poor housing and overcrowding, that were said to encourage incest. But there was no consistent or sustained effort by the press to put this issue up the public agenda, as W.T. Stead had done in his infamous Maiden Tribute campaign in the, in the 1880s. And the press did not help to generate any momentum for reform. Flickers of outrage failed to spark off more heated and high-profile debates. Reporting was episodic and fatalistic, as if these crimes were an inevitable feature of society. The popular newspapers that dominated the increasingly competitive market after the First World War were less keen on the controversial investigative journalism pioneered by Stead. Titles such as the Daily Mail, the Daily Express and the News of the World were highly attuned to the interests and needs of their target readerships and advertisers and sought to produce colourful and varied publications packed with human interest. Editors were content to use court reporting as cheap and reliable forms of entertainment and titillation, and rarely highlighted or commented upon wider social issues. Elite newspapers such as The Times and Manchester Guardian had a different set of news values and provided more detailed reporting, but they tended to focus their editorialising and opinion pieces on what they perceived to be the important matters of high politics, economic policy and foreign affairs. Abuse was further shielded by a British political culture which enabled considerable institutional secrecy and encouraged respect and deference to authorities and high-status individuals. 
So the bulk of the coverage of child sexual abuse, what we now call child sexual abuse, in national and local newspapers comprised of brief factual reports of court proceedings, usually under euphemistic headlines that did not draw attention to the sexual nature of the alleged offences. So we have here um, serious charge against fishermen uh, in the Hull Daily Mail in June 1920 over an 11 line report of the murder of a 13 year old girl who was, according to the police, outraged, probably stunned, and thrown into a pond while still alive. Uh, the other one on the other side, mother's shock sees stranger with her child on the omnibus, ran a Daily Mail headline in August 1927 focusing on the drama of a mother unexpectedly seeing her five-year-old daughter being taken away onto a bus by an unknown man, rather than the subsequent indecent assault charge. Some reports were so discreetly placed that they were not headlined at all. Only those reading their paper carefully and able to decipher the euphemisms would have, been, would have appreciated the regularity of these offences. If there was any commentary on cases of this type, it almost came in the form of extracts from the judges summing up. This ensured that the paper's framing and interpretation of child sexual abuse was dictated largely by the legal establishment, which, as Carol Smart has pointed out, was one of the main sites of resistance to the reconceptualisation of the subject sought by feminists and child welfare campaigners, and also the source of the most unreconstructed notion of the child as vicious or mendacious. So we have... Uh, regular judicial suggestions that girls were complicit in or tainted by uh, their abuse. Reporting from the Devon Assizes in October 1925, for example, the Devon and Evan, uh, Exeter Gazette recorded a judge's regret that a female victim of abuse would not leave her school as had been requested. He quite understood respectable people would not like their children to go to the same school as a girl like this one in the present case. Days later, the same paper recorded a judge's statement that it did seem rather regrettable, and a place where the law rather failed, that nothing could ever be done in the case of little girls under 16 with whom offences were committed, and who often, of course, were guilty themselves. Sometimes they were as guilty as the male. Blame was also sometimes attached to wives and mothers with accusations that they had not done enough to satisfy their husbands or safeguard their children. In July 1925, the whole Daily Mail reported on the case of a 48-year-old fitter who was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for incest with two of his daughters and assaulting two others. Five lines of the 11-line report were focused on the failings of the mother, who protested that she had been terrified for years into silence. The judge was dismissively unsympathetic, observing that threats to murder would not have the slightest effect on the mind of any decent, ordinary Englishwoman. Some cases, usually involving some dramatic or unusual elements, got slightly more extensive coverage, but this consisted in giving more detail from the court proceedings rather than journalistic commentary, investigation or speculation. One such case involved Harford Graham Green, a 60-year-old businessman, magistrate and parish councillor who was convicted in 1925 of indecently assaulting a 15-year-old girl. Green was a charity fundraiser for St Thomas's Hospital London, raising significant sums for the hospital, in today's terms, three to four million pounds. In a case with uncomfortable echoes of Jimmy Savile, he exploited this position to gain the trust of teenage girls who were helping him to fundraise. In an extraordinary ruse, he invited girls to his home and workplace on the pretense that he had a new device that could project their images using radio waves. He asked them to undress so he could take their measurements to ensure their suitability for modelling or dancing work, all undertaken whilst the girls' mothers were in the room. Motivated by deference or prospects of employment, the mothers didn't intervene. The unusual features of this trial ensured that it was covered in a number of national and local newspapers and the courtroom evidence was recapitulated in greater detail than was typical, but once again, there was no consideration of any broader issues raised by these events and the judges' criticisms of the mothers received considerable prominence. The case reached the front page of the Hull Daily Mail under the eye-catching headline, A Refinement of Lust, for example, but the report highlighted the fact that Green at least avoided some of the grosser forms of handling and that the mothers had been guilty of behaviour that was reprehensible in the extreme, harsher language than used against Green. It's clear that men were assumed to be driven by natural instinct and drives. It was women's responsibility and duty to protect themselves and their daughters from unwanted advances. 
Broader reflection on child sexual abuse was rare and only came in very particular forms. As has been noted, space was often given to judges' comments and sometimes these raised, ranged beyond the specifics of particular cases. Newspapers recorded these passively, though, and were rarely inclined to generate talking points about them. In April 1922 and June 1925, for example, Mr Judge Justice Roach spoke about the important role the press could play in publicising sexual abuse within the family, because many did not know that incest was unlawful, although they knew it was wrong, and explicitly criticised the culture of euphemism that surrounded the topic. It would be better for the newspapers to call a spade a spade and state that there had been a conviction for incest or rape instead of referring to an indecent offence. This appeal was taken up by Mr Justice Cardi in July 1927. Again and again he had seen men and women in the dock who, through suppression of the reports of these cases, said they did not know incest was a crime. He hoped no false delicacy would stop the newspapers publishing the convictions so that there could be no excuse for a plea of ignorance. But these comments were not picked up or pursued in editorial commentary and opinion pieces, and newspapers were very slow to lose the security of the euphemistic language. There are also a number of cases where judges criticise aspects of the sentencing policy or professional practices in ways which the press again could easily but did not assume. In November 1924, for example, the whole Daily Mail reported the conviction of a 41-year-old labourer for incest. Describing the cases about as frightful as it ever come before a court of justice, Mr Justice Talbot declared that the seven-year prison sentence which the law allowed for such an offence was very far from sufficient. Despite the gravity of the case, very few details were provided and the judge's comments were not used as a springboard for further discussion. Three days later, the same judge criticised the Crown Prosecution for failing to conduct a VD test on a labourer accused of indecent assault. It was obvious in these cases, the judges noted, in which medical evidence was so important that prisoners should be examined. Despite the proximity of these cases and the significant, judges, significant criticisms made by the same judge, they were not connected up and there was no editorial response. Similarly, when we look at the campaigning of women's organisations um, who helped generate political pressure for reforming the laws governing sexual offences, we find um, reporting, but very little editorial commentary. So we have reporting of the Criminal Law Amendment Act in 1922, uh, and on the right here, the uh, report of the Departmental Committee on Sexual Offences Against Young People, um, these policy debates were reported, but the coverage was factual and passive without any editorial in intervention. There were no leading articles on the subject, opinion articles were not commissioned, letters were not published, and there was no apparent appetite to conduct any further investigation. One of the reasons that the political and legal establishment was able to ignore the 1925 report, despite lobbying from women's organisations, was because the press showed little interest in keeping the issue high on the public agenda. And similarly, when we have examples of uh, women's organisations trying to use dramatic language to interest the press, um, similarly passive responses. In January 1929, a delegate at the National Union of Women Teachers annual conference made an urgent plea for more women police officers to protect children in public spaces and claimed that so great were the dangers of assault and indecency in the parks today that mothers no longer dared allow their children to play in them. The following year, Miss Kelly, one of the members of the Departmental, Departmental Committee on Sexual Offences Against Young People, moved a resolution at the Conference of the National Council of Women deploring the delay in introducing legislation to implement the committee's recommendations, despite what she highlighted as an astounding increase in sexual crime. In both cases, the remarks were picked up by the press but given little prominence and not taken further. So, in the 1920s and 30s, what we now call child sexual abuse was clearly not hidden. There were relatively frequent court reports and some coverage of the debates in judicial, parliamentary and policy-making circles. But the issue never really became high profile, partly because of a lack of press interest in it. Very quickly, I want to sort of look at some slight shifts in reporting styles uh, in subsequent decades. Um, after the Second World War, it's possible to discern an increasing use of scientific, sexological and psychological languages, although the euphemistic culture had not disappeared and there were still real constraints in reporting. Um, there were clear signs of a greater sensationalism um, 
partly due to changing relationships between the journalists and the police, and partly due to a growing tendency to pathologise offenders. The police increasingly used the press to warn of offenders who were still at large, leading to a genre of manhunt articles laden with narratives of sexual danger involving dangerous and unpredictable sex maniacs. In August 1960, for example, the Daily Mail reported that 500 police in London were last night hunting a sex maniac who poses as a detective. He has raped a seven-year-old girl and assaulted at least four others. Scotland Yard fears that unless he is caught soon, the life of an unsuspecting child may be in great danger. If any child returns home saying she has been questioned by a CID man who produced a card saying police, her parents are asked to telephone the yard or nearest police station at once. Such dramatic warnings, published indiscriminately to a national readership, highlighted the sexual threats that could be faced by any child. This offender was finally caught in September 1960, betrayed, according to a journalist writing in true crime fiction style, because of the warts on his hand. Nevertheless, with his record of assaulting 50 girls, the coverage of his trial remained relatively modest. And there are similar examples. Um, here's an example of, sort of narratives of sexual danger relating to the so-called mad dog of Jersey. Uh, and similarly, we can look at the same sort of coverage in, um, the, uh, in relation to the Moore's murders. Such coverage consolidated the focus on the threat of evil strangers who were characterised by their distance from society and social norms. The preoccupation with individual evil discouraged consideration of broader social, cultural or policy issues and there continued to be little press interest in wider discussions of sexual abuse. Rare editorial interventions in this post-war period tended to conflate child sexual abuse with the broader social problem of homosexuality. In the early 1950s, for example, the Sunday Pictorial carried out a tenacious pursuit of the head of the London Choir School at St Michael's College at Bexley in Kent. In consecutive front page headlines in July 1951, Father Ingram was accused of being an imposter and an abuser. Ingram issued a writ to close down the story, but this was dismissed two years later, and Ingram was eventually convicted of five serious offences against three ex-pupils and sentenced to ten years imprisonment. During its investigations, the pictorial uncovered other cases of abuse and exposed those too. But this, at this moment, the press was whipping up a broader moral panic about homosexuality, which would lead to the establishment of the Wolfenden Committee to investigate. And the exposure of Ingram was presented as part of the problem of homosexuality rather than being defined separately. If you love children, this is the urgent lesson of the evil father Ingram, wrote Colin Valdar, the pictorial editor. How many other private schools without effective supervision are exposing children to the care of known homosexuals? The issue was soon swallowed up in the wider debate about the recommendations of the Wolfenden Committee and the case for homosexual law reform. Very briefly, then, to, talk, to conclude, um, it's only really in the mid-1970s that there were major shifts in the coverage of child sexual abuse. The coverage not only received extensive press attention, but quickly came to be seen as one of the defining problems of the age. The immediate trigger for this transition to the new era was the emergence of paedophile rights organisations in the mid-1970s. These organisations provided a prime target for press moralising and crusading and became a convenient stick to use against permissiveness. The press used its resources to make them a major story and we have a proliferation of, you know, we have front page headlines, um, editorials, letters, investigations, the whole sort of panoply of the uh, press machine now is turned to this issue. Um, and we can sort of see um, cases now in contrast to that very um, brief, factual, passive, euphemistic coverage, we now get uh, what the press calls disaster coverage, where we have whole front um, sections of newspapers cleared to cover um, major cases. So here we have in 1983 the so Brighton Beast case, um, front page coverage, um, the Vital Clues as the Hunt Goes On, page 2 and 3. Women Sharing the Boys Horror, page 5. We Must Turn Back the Side of Evil, um, Editorial uh, Opinion. Uh, Brighten the Town Without Innocence. You know, we have investigations and, and, and commentaries covering you know, the whole first section of uh, the paper. Why this shift? Um, very briefly, I want to identify four clusters of uh, factors. 
First, the erosion of the culture of euphemism and sexual caution due to the high profile and extensive debates of the 1960s and subsequently about sexual behaviour. Um, related to this, the legislative reforms of the 1960s, which ensured that the state regulation of sexuality was both shifting and contested, while the acceptance of the Wolfenden reforms and the criminalisation of consenting adult male homosexuality clarified the distinction between the homosexual and the paedophile. Second, the resurgence of feminism seen in the rise of the women's liberation movement uh, and the publicity it obtained by individuals such as Jermaine Greer encouraged a widespread rethinking of sexuality, particularly focusing on the prevalence of male violence and abuse and demanding greater attention to the harassment that happened in everyday life and family settings. Third, a shift towards more child-centric thinking in a number of areas, including the fields of education, criminal justice and leisure. Greater account was taken of the needs and desires of children and of how the world looked from their perspective. Children's voices were treated with greater respect and seen as having more credibility. The disciplinary cultures of the past were softened and indeed increasingly viewed with some suspicion. And fourth, significant changes in the newspaper market and newspaper culture in the wake of uh, Rupert Murdoch's relaunch of The Sun in 1969. Fleet Street witnessed a wave of tabloidisation and the press became more populist, outspoken and interventionist. Court and crime reporting became far less passive and cases were selected, packaged and sensationalised more carefully and explicitly, often in the service of particular political or social causes, such as the attack on permissiveness. In combination, these shifts enabled child sexual abuse to be identified as a specific and important social problem, for it to be widely and explicitly discussed by newspapers by now both deeply interested in and highly attuned to changes in sexual culture, and for these debates to be seen as important contributions to wider political and cultural contests over the future of Britain. Oh. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks. Well, hopefully our presentations will kind of um, uh, dovetail quite nicely, because Adrian's told you a lot about the various shifts in language that were um, uh, developing over the course of the 20th century. And the way in which the, the late 20th century starts to see a new vernacular uh, language for talking about um, child sexual abuse. But of course, these um, various languages are not very manipulable by children, child victims themselves, or adult victims of child sexual abuse. It's often fueled by um, the sorts of testimony, as, as Adrian said, that comes out of the criminal justice system. It's a very sort of processed or um, uh, constrained kind of. Um, knowledge making, if you like, on this topic. Um, th there is another source of um, knowledge and knowledge making um, in, in this period, which um, I'll just touch on, which is the medical profession's interest from around the 1950s in the US and a little later in Britain. Uh, first of all, um, in uh, the kind of fractures and bruises of, of infancy that, that start to get termed uh, the battered baby syndrome. Uh, but that gives way to uh, a stronger interest in sexual abuse in later decades. And that's depicted and categorised through new guidance which is given uh, to medics in, in journals like The Lancet or um, the British Medical Journal, which has a, a kind of graphic presentation of child sexual abuse in the depiction of what are often decontextualised parts of the body. They're, they're about penetrated orifices, essentially, and, and what these look like. So there is a, a kind of... Um, uh, a language written on the body, if you like, for um, uh, displaying and, uh, and um, making sense of child sexual abuse. And for some commentators, the stories which were told by abuse survivors, which is really the, the topic of my um, uh, presentation, some felt that these stories were so culturally stigmatised, so likely never to be heard, or in fact never to be told in the first place, that the language of the body was a more progressive register. And this uh, came out particularly strongly in the 1987, 1986-87 um, sequence of events in um, Cleveland, where a large number of children were taken into care um, uh, on the basis of what um, was seen as a very controversial um, test, the reflex anal dilation test. And to give you a sense of that, I've got a quote here from Lee Campbell, who was a campaigner, a journalist very involved in that particular case. 
And she's describing here the language, if you like, of the body. Um, and perhaps the most relevant part of this uh, quote is the, the final sentence. The appearance of dramatic physical signs were telling a story that the victim itself couldn't tell. Now this may well be true, uh, particularly is true, I think, of, of pre-verbal um, infants who suffer child sexual abuse, but for older children, this kind of um, uh, language of the body assumes, in a way, too much silence, too much passivity amongst victims. And this contrasts both with the historical work that's been done on this topic, and you can hear Linda Gordon's work on um, uh, families who um, suffered uh, various kinds of abuse and violence, um, but also the contemporary uh, uh, literature on uh, disclosures of child sexual abuse by children, which suggests that, in fact, uh, most people who experience this do try and get help in one way or another, although the disclosures may be quite various, and some of them are non-verbal uh, disclosures. So I'm going to try to look at this question of the, the kinds of disclosures. Sometimes this is about voices, sometimes it's about behaviour. Um, and where these feature in this, in this kind of discursive landscape that has particular kinds of um, um, available languages in the press, uh, in the medical profession. We can see that the testimony of children starts to be listened to much more systematically, and a good sort of, you know, uh, moment for this is, is the launch of Childline in 1987. And by 1990, I've got a quote here from um, an NSPCC officer writing in The Guardian who says, we've learned over many years that young children telling us about these things tend to tell the truth. A sense of a, a very changed uh, reception there. And you can see, to give a sense of the scale of the problem, uh, nearly 16,000 children are counselled for um, child sexual abuse in 2011. And of course, that's uh, not reflected in the criminal justice system, which is not seeing anything like those kinds of um, numbers. Those who had experienced uh, sexual abuse as children borrowed a term that had become common, I think, in a number of different movements, but I, I, I link it to the, the, the psychiatric users movement, the, the idea of the survivor. And recent work by um, Jennifer Crane has shown in the 1990s that there's all sorts of movements that are founded specifically to listen and support um, these survivors, such as the National Association of People Abused in Childhood. So beyond the kind of specific stories that the media are willing to listen to and the physical evidence to which the medics are attentive, we've got, I think, the stories of children and adults getting a new hearing. And, and of course, this is an ongoing process, and we can see it built into the, um, uh, the testimony for that the independent inquiry are going to be uh, experimenting with. So in this paper, I'm going to really look back in the periods before Childline, before the survivor movement, to ask uh, what kinds of disclosures children and adults made about um, their experiences of sexual abuse. And the reason for doing this is partly it gives us a really interesting way of trying to understand the circumstances of abuse. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll note that unlike the cases that Adrian talked about, the cases that I'm talking about are ones that don't make it to the criminal justice system. So it gives us a sense of that iceberg that's under the visible tip, if you like, the visible tip that the press and reporters and the courts are dealing with. There's an iceberg underneath of, 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 um, of cases of abuse that don't lead to any kind of agency intervention. It gives us a little sense of that. But it also, I think, um, helps us understand how people could narrate this question, this, this, this experience, what children and adults thought they could or should say about their experiences, and what reception those kinds of disclosures got, so what people heard them to be saying. Now the conventional wisdom here is that children uh, were not believed, and if I was giving a longer version of this paper I'd go into some detail here, but in some senses Adrian has already um, given you a sense, I think, of, of just why and how children are not believed, but this is a uh, um, a set of um, quotes from different kinds of areas of, of practitioners, which gives you a sense of the kinds of disbelief that these disclosures, that people disclosing face. So first one was a judge, and, and we've already heard how, um, how hostile the legal um, profession is. The second one is a very interesting letter that um, uh, comes from a, a settlement worker, settlement house worker, in 1918, and this is in response to the, the scandal which set off the first Home Office inquiry into child sexual abuse, which was um, uh, uh, about um, a, what was in effect an approved school um, in Dorset. 
where the, the, the director of the school was accused um, uh, on, by quite a few individuals of um, abusing uh, children. And, and it's interesting that, that this, this woman writes back to say, well, everyone, everyone gets these accusations. It's an occupational hazard. Everyone is accused, and that's just something we all have to live with. So a real sense here of we don't have to listen or take seriously these, um, uh, these accusations. And then the third one is from um, uh, a pair of criminologists who are writing about um, sexual off offending in the 1960s, and it, it, it brings up this idea that a lot of it is fantasised, and that is repeated across the board. Um, I think it's particularly true of the post-war period, that there's this sense that um, uh, you know, children are, are, have, have, have a sexuality, and it sometimes has these kinds of very elaborate, fantasised um, uh, uh, ways of, of coming forward. And we know too, so as well as this culture of disbelief, we know too that um, when the stories are sometimes told, and even if they're sometimes believed, that they remain very shameful, and children were encouraged to move on very swiftly. And it was widely believed for much of the 20th century that they could do that, that the best thing to do was to forget, and that forgetting would be a kind of um, uh, solace to them. And, and the title of my talk today, Disgusting Details Which Are Best Forgotten, is taken um, uh, is not an ironic direction to us all, but is taken from the 1928 report of the Home Office Children's Branch, and the fuller um, uh, version of that is there, and it's talking about the fact that parents don't come to court because they don't want their children to have to tell this story. These are disgusting details that are best forgotten. And these attitudes persisted across uh, the 20th century. So in 1988, a senior probation officer um, who was writing about um, sexual assault, wrote that um, adult horror is the main traumatising um, effect here, not the actual experience of abuse itself. So he commented, even when guilt has been established, this may be in some cases more traumatic than the victim than the actual abuse itself. So the court case, the process of dealing with it, is regarded as more traumatic, therefore um, uh, court action was often not sought. Now lots of abused children, of course, did not disclose. And given all these countervailing tendencies of what we might term this, this culture of disbelief, um, uh, it's no surprise that we, we will probably never know uh, very much about the, the large number of cases of sexual abuse. But I, I do want to try and be a bit more um, historically specific today about what kind of disbelief and inaction children and adults faced. And looking at some of these cases of disgusting details today um, helps us trace out what I'm going to talk about as a culture of silence that accompanied this culture of disbelief that I've already sketched out for you. I'm going to look at three different kinds of um, uh, silences that are experienced. The first one is a kind of self-imposed uh, silence, and I'm taking this from uh, an oral history um, testimony. Quite a lot of my evidence is coming from oral histories, and I should stress that these are oral histories that are taken from individuals that are not that they're not designed to be about child sexual abuse, but disclosures of abuse are made during the um, the course of the the interview. So when Mrs. Freeman, who was born in 1891, was interviewed in 1971 as a participant in one of the earliest and most ambitious of the British Oral History Project, the, the audience, I'm sure most of you know um, that uh, collection very well, she struggled to convey what had happened to her as a child at a London railway station. She wasn't clear about her age, it was, happened between the ages of six and ten. She had gone to meet her father who was coming back from work and she had bought some sweets and she recalled after that, after I was nearly, I tell you, I was nearly strangled and I, I don't know what to say, lots of hesitations here. Some kind of assault had occurred and that led to her being questioned um, by police. Now, it may have had a sexual nature, it's not clear to me whether it is or not. I'm reading it as having a sexual nature um, because of a number of, of, of clues that she gives. One of them is the mention of sweets. Now, she wasn't given sweets by anybody, she bought sweets herself. But nonetheless, there's a, a tacit sign here, I think, of sexual content, because the offering of sweets to children was a very widely um, understood signal of malign sexual um, intention. It's, it features a lot in, in, the, in the press reports that our project um, turned up. There's another clue which is given by the fact that she um, is asked by the interviewer, well, what really happened here? You know, what, what, was, what was the nature of this assault? 
And um, instead of answering it, she substitutes another story in place of her own. And she, she seamlessly moves on to some recent events in the 1960s where uh, a girl in her neighborhood was assaulted by, quote, a drunken Irishman uh, who, was, uh, uh, who was jailed for nine months. She, she again doesn't want to talk about the sexual content of this, but she gives a few hints. She says, she describes how they had been out together for a night and he had been treating her all night. And she also talks about how pretty the, the victim was. So again, there's a very sort of veiled sense here that this was a, um, a sexual assault. It's very interesting that she, um, I don't think particularly notices the fact that she's moved on from her own story and has substituted um, this other one. She's struggling really to talk about this. She's using a standing anecdote and she is struggling to find words. It may be that this is a, an interview that really reflects the fact that there isn't really a usable language. Even in 71, which is um, in the period where Adrian has told us, you know, the press in some ways is providing these, these narratives of, of sexual danger, but she's um, unable to deploy that language. Also, I think that her confusion, her silence over the detail here uh, might also be to do with it being a, that, that's a very typical cognitive response to experiences of trauma, which can lead to a lot of confusion over what is remembered. And to give you an example of this, this is um, another survivor's testimony about um, her sexual abuse experienced as a child in the 50s and 60s um, in an oral history interview. It gives you a, a sense. I was a very anxious person. A lot of my experience was in school. I wasn't there. My head wasn't there. My head wasn't anywhere. In fact, where it was, was probably trying to survive the endangerment of my person. I can't remember a thing about 1969, not a thing. I think I was distracted, so my memories of things are vague. So an inability to name and a refusal to remember is characteristic of some, some of these quite chaotic um, uh, disclosures of child sexual abuse. Now let's turn to another kind of source, which is all, also from an oral history interview, which reveals another kind of silence as a response to a child's disclosure of abuse. And I'm going to talk now about Mrs. Arnold, who was born in 1925. And between the ages of around six and nine, she was repeatedly sexually assaulted by her grandfather. Uh, she, she was living with him in Dundee in a, in a very poor working class household. Now, after some years of this assault that's happening, her response to one um, episode was uh, to, to take action that would bring the abuse out into the open. She locked her bedroom door. And this led to her grandmother confronting her to say, you know, why have you locked your door? And she explained uh, that his, her, her grandfather had, quote, pulled his toto out, that was what we called his private part, and he had asked me to hold it. Her grandmother's response to this is very interesting. She's absolutely outraged. But she responds in a very practical way by laying down these guidelines for behaviour. I was never to be left alone with him ever again, and if my nanny wasn't in and he was just there on his own, I had to stay outside and play. The grandmother didn't have any grounds for doing much more about the fact that her partner and her husband had been assaulting their granddaughter, so she couldn't get a divorce about this behaviour, but she did declare her marriage to be practically over, and for the rest of her life she never spoke to her husband again. So there's a very deep silence there at the heart of this story. It's very hard for us to know how typical this action uh, might have been, but it does suggest, of course, that when a child disclose, discloses abuse, it can rend the, uh, the social fabric of a family in a very, very dramatic way. And there's no trace here, it's important to note, of disbelief, no trace that this is somehow an accepted part of working class life. I think that her, Mrs. Arnold's um, relatives here might have been quite uh, typical in seeking a pragmatic and reputation preserving solution. And the resulting silence was there, it was preserved in this case vis-a-vis -vis, um, neighbours, um, outsiders, but also of course at the heart of this relationship um, with her grandparents. Now for, for Mrs Arnold herself, this solution of, of segregation and, and, and familial silence was less than ideal. And she recalled being blamed by other family members for having um, uh, precipitated the breakdown in her grandmother's uh, marriage. Auntie Peggy used to say to me that maybe I'd imagined it and it was wrong for her dad to get in trouble with her mum over it. And also the family resolution hadn't provided a means to identify where guilt lay because Mrs Arnold concluded I blamed myself for a long time. And she went back over her memories of her um, uh, interactions with her grandfather and sort of reassessed them and began to name the content of, of, of what had happened as what she called rude treatment. <coughs> 
Interestingly, however, she didn't want the label that the interview interviewer gave her, which was the label of sexual assault. She insisted, he, as I realise now, never sexually assaulted me, and by that she means penetrative sex. So she was willing to use language such as rude and dirty, but not the language of, um, of sexual assault. I think this is a case where she had been able to produce a comprehensible narrative of what had happened to her. She had enough composure to tell this story in a, um, in a joined up way. But I think that the various languages that were available to her in the 1980s to name her experiences, such as the languages that Adrian has talked about of child assault, child abuse, paedophilia and so on. These were not languages that she chose to adopt, perhaps because they still didn't really capture the routine abuse of children within family settings by a close relative. That had been her experience. So let's turn now to another kind of disclosure. This is my, uh, my last example. And this, in a way, is a very deliberate refusal of silence made by an adult. And the disclosure here was made in a personal memoir by a working class Cornish writer who published under the pseudonym Emma Smith. She, uh, she wrote a memoir about her turn of the century childhood and it was published in 1954 after she had appealed to a successful uh, novelist and writer, A.L. Rouse. Rouse took her um, sort of collection of anecdotes about her childhood and turned it into a sort of co coherent book, brought it to publishers and helped her um, uh, publish it. So in some senses it may well have been his uh, influence that helped her to narrativize the abuse and put it into a comprehensible framework. Like Mrs. Arnold, who I described just now, Emma Smith was brought up in very chaotic and neglectful surroundings. She was illegitimate, she was born in 1894, she was raised by her grandparents and also partly in the workhouse because she had been rejected by her mother. She lived with Mr. Pratt, uh, I think that's a pseudonym in fact, uh, a travelling organ grinder for some years. Uh, because her own family couldn't support her. Uh, and she worked with him singing, um, singing in the streets and collecting money. She was on the tramp, if you like. And she recalled his sexual approaches. One evening I found myself alone with Mr. Pratt. For a while he sat looking at me in an evil way that made me afraid. At last he said, come here, Emma. I obeyed slowly. This beast, old enough to be my grandfather, grabbed hold of me, a child about six years of age, if I was that. He undid some of my clothing and behaved in a disgusting way. Presently he said, don't tell Ma or Charlie what I've done, or something awful will happen. And this was repeated uh, uh, throughout the time that she was with him, and she was also sexually abused by a, a casual lodger who was um, uh, sleeping in the same corner uh, as she slept. And like so many children, you can see here that a threat very successfully um, uh, silences her. She, 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 she doesn't want to tell anyone what's happened. And she, uh, she went on to say, fear of Pratt kept me silent. In addition to which, I did not know how to express myself in the matter of his unnatural behaviour. So you see, there's this language emerging again of disgusting, unnatural, um, but it's still quite euphemistic. At some point in her childhood, Emma was briefly cared for at a Salvation Army home, uh, and they later on rejected her, um, sent her literally back out to the streets, because she had sung songs which had sexually explicit, explicit um, lyrics. And in some ways now, if, if, if that was happening today, we would probably label that as a form of indirect um, uh, disclosure of, of sexual abuse. And the research on this suggests that this is quite a common strategy for children who are, who, who are under the age of about 12. Later, she ran away from home uh, and she was rescued, so-called, by a, a Sunday school teacher. She was sent um, but for a medical examination by a doctor who certified that she had been, quote, ruined by a man. Although, in fact, it doesn't quite make sense, this story, because she hadn't uh, told anyone that she had been um, abused, and nor did this doctor physically examine her. So, you know, she's, in some ways, she's, she's, um, she's somebody who's being um, uh, judged um, on not very clear grounds. Um, and, in fact, she was sent then to a penitentiary who, which was designed for prostitutes. So she was, in a sense, being labelled within, with, within another, another sexual narrative of prostitution. Um, she didn't tell anyone about her abuse except a chaplain who didn't take any action. So uh, although she did disclose, it was only in the context of a religious um, setting. And the institution itself was very premised on silence. It said, um, it advised its, its, its members not to tell anyone that they came from this penitentiary. 
um, because that would cause difficulties for them in, in, in gaining employment. And that silence caused Emma a, a huge amount of, of, of distress. She did get married and had uh, three children, but she made repeated suicide um, attempts and suffered in ways that we would today probably want to call post-traumatic. But her memoir does disclose the abuse in a very direct way, and, and that's very interesting. There's lots we could say about it, but today I'm just going to quickly dwell on the reception. It was a very successful book, and that's very helpful for us, historically speaking, because it gives us lots of, um, of, of reviews. It was serialised on the radio, for example. But if we look at the press, reviewers were very disinclined to discuss or even name her abuse as sexual. So the Labour paper, the Tribune, noted in its review, here is a story of underfeeding, cruelty and of human beastliness in the good old days before the welfare state. But it, in fact it's Emma Smith's mother who's really blamed for being what it calls criminally heartless, alongside the penitentiary that is described, quote, as showing in inhuman high-mindedness. High so there's no mention here of um, sexual abuse, and clearly this is a, a narrative that's being used to um, support a certain kind of vision of the welfare state. In contrast, when Country Life reviewed the book, they take the opposite approach, and they use Emma's story to talk about how valuable the Salvation Army um, and the penitentiary care was that she received. Quote, it was what she needed, it was the security she was seeking. Also, there's no mention of sexual abuse. It was reviewed in the TLS, Times Literary Supplement, and declared to, to have, quote, the appeal of a primitive, at once pathetic and compelling. The sexual abuse, abuse there is only named as Pratt's behaviour to her. That's the euphemism that's used. And again, it talks about inadequate mothering. Only one paper, the New Statesman and Nation, actually names the abuse as sexual. So I think this is an interesting case study of um, a refusal of silence by, um, by a survivor here, but also um, a very clear sense of the kinds of silences that might greet disclosures of abuse in public discourse, and the ways in which dis disclosures are sometimes being manipulated and used for other means, in this case for political point scoring about welfare uh, policies. So, um, to sum up, um, we've seen in um, the work of a lot of historians that the 20th century, and in particular its final decades, have been characterised by the idea of a shift to a more uh, confessional culture, and Adrian's work on the press has certainly um, highlighted this, as has wonderful um, uh, recent work by Deborah Cohen. They've looked at the ways in which confession is being elicited and, and promoted in, in lots of different diverse uh, settings, journalism, misery memoirs, oral history, um, counselling services, and so on. Most historians see this as a kind of protracted process that lasts the century, but it becomes intensified in the late 20th century. Victims of sexual abuse, whether these are children or adults who are disclosing um, abuse as children, I think have benefited from this, and we can see changes in how they're received from the late 1980s um, and the new infrastructure that helps them. But the silence and the refusal to hear and the inaction that greeted the stories of many of those who disclosed abuse reminds us that the, these possibilities for confession are certainly not um, equally or evenly uh, distributed. And the cases I've described today show how uh, disclosures were being greeted with strategies of containment or denial. And these are, of course, very disruptive, very disturbing stories. It's interesting to me that in all these cases, the telling of this um, uh, narrative about sexual abuse doesn't seem to bring much closure, doesn't bring much comfort to those who are abused. Their narratives are being adapted uh, um, for other purposes in ways that don't really acknowledge the, um, the needs or, in fact, the narrative agency of the person who, I think, um, is being abused. And it's worth stressing that in none of these cases do any of these lead to any kind of criminal uh, um, investigation or conviction. As a result, they remain angry and disoriented in later life. As one put it, quote, I lived with all my life a kind of unease, a kind of internal bod bodily unease, and a massive struggle across my life to feel at ease. And it's also somewhat chilling, uh, given the current revelations about uh, child sexual abuse in the post-war decades, to see that Emma Smith ended her narrative with the observation, quote, if my story does nothing else, at least it will cheer the reader to reflect that what I describe in the following pages could not happen in the year of grace, 1950.